I'm Father Mitch Packle, and welcome to Scripture and Tradition, where we take a look at the Word of God. And today, we're going to continue to examine the episodes of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, especially focusing on the not-so-empty tomb. Take a look at how the angels and then the first appearances of the risen Christ took place. Now, if you have any questions or comments related specifically to today's topic, we invite you to be part of the show by calling us during the live program, just Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the number you can call if you're in North America is one 800 221 9460 1-800-221-9460. If you are outside North America, you can still call, but the number is country code 1, area code 205-271-2980. 205-271-2980. Or you can contact us by email, writing to Scripture and Tradition at EWTN.com or follow us and participate with the show on YouTube. All right. So we are dealing with chapter 11 of my, excuse me, chapter 7 of my book. Uh, and we are, which is Wheat and Tares, by the way, Restoring the Moral Vision of a Scandalized Church. You can get that book at EWTN's Religious Catalog. Uh, just go to EWTNRC.com where it is item number 81098. If you already have the book and you're following along, you can, uh, we'll be starting today's discussion at page 170. Okay? So, if you recall, I mentioned last week that we'll be going through the different parts of that first Easter Sunday, that first day of the resurrection. And right now we're dealing with the early morning on the first day of the week, which for Jewish people was Sunday. And we'll take a look at the tomb and the angels and the first time Jesus appears. So, Remember that it is in the early morning that we see the scene open up in the Gospels, um, Matthew 28, uh, Mark 16, uh, Luke 24, and John 20. Those are the places where we see the description of what happened to our Lord and we see in Matthew 28, verse 1, Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the sepulcher. Uh, sepulcher just means tomb. It's a good Latin word. Uh, sepulcra is the uh, Latin word for it. And so we see Mary Magdalene is there as, as she had been at the cross. Um, if you recall that uh, these people were mentioned in Matthew 27, uh, verses 55 to 56. There were also many women there looking on from afar who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. So that those are three of the women who are mentioned there. And these are, uh, and this translation said Joseph, but it would be Joses. Uh, and you re may remember them. Uh, James and Joses were mentioned uh, earlier in the gospel as the brothers of Jesus. Now this is very significant. A lot of folks just don't, pay close attention, but these brothers of Jesus are now shown to be the sons of a woman named Mary, 
but not the same Mary that is the mother of Jesus. It's her sister. So, or actually sister-in-law. Get into some of that later. Um, and uh, St. Matthew does not mention the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Uh, th that is mentioned elsewhere. Uh, the sons of Zebedee are James and John. Remember that? They were the ones who were in their boat, uh, their boat when uh, they were called by Jesus. And they're the, James is the older brother. John is the younger. Uh, both sons of Zebedee. But, and their mother is mentioned. But uh, Mark does mention a certain Salome. Let's take a look at Mark 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and, uh, and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. Um, Salome seems to be the name of the mother of James and John. So a number of these people are around. And, you know, why are they around in particular? Well, they're ministering to Jesus, but also... Uh, Mary, who's the mother of James and Joses, was married to Clopas. And Clopas was the brother of St. Joseph. We see that. If you, I, if you get a chance, you can download this for free from the Internet, uh, from our own library. It's, it's called the uh, Ecclesiastical History or the Church History by Eusebius of Caesarea, and he quotes St. Hegesippus, who met uh, the grandchildren of, the grandson, actually, of St. Jude the Apostle, the one that didn't betray Jesus, and he said, he explained to him that Clopas was St. Joseph's brother. So his wife and he are the parents of Jesus' brothers. Why? Because they're his cousins. These are uh, Clopas and uh, was uh, Jesus' uncle and, uh, and his wife as well, of course. So the, the, the part of the family, and then, of course, the mother of James and John. Remember, she's the same woman, apparently Salome, who had said to Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, can you make sure that my sons sit one at your right and the other at your left? Remember that? And so these, these are some of the people. Um, so all this is, uh, you know, the, the characters are showing up. Why were they coming to the tomb? That's even more important than figuring out who all these people are. Well, that's interesting in itself. First, it says in Mark 16, verse 1, that they brought spices. Now the word used is aromata. So the, uh, an aroma, we, we still use the word for something that smells good. Uh, but these aromata were spices and it's used especially, not exclusively, but in ancient Greek it was used especially for the kind of uh, fragrances that you put with the dead to reduce the bad smell that comes with human decay or any animal decay. When animals de decay, it smells very bad. And so um, they would put these uh, aromas, in, usually in a liquid form, sometimes solid, but usually liquid, uh, especially to cover the face. This was not for embalming. Uh, Jewish people didn't embalm the way the um, Egyptians might. Uh, that, that just, they didn't do that. But they did want to reduce the bad smell, or at least offset it. You can't reduce it, but you can offset the bad smell. And what's significant about this detail is they were coming to anoint a corpse. They were not coming to the tomb because they expected to see the resurrected Jesus. They did not expect the resurrection. 
This is key. They didn't have faith in Jesus' resurrection. So we see in Mark chapter 16, verse 2, and very early on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb when the sun had risen. So, and you, if you, hopefully, you've been up during sunrise, and you know there's the faint glow that starts uh, the earth spinning into the sunlight, and then it gets brighter and brighter. And you still, it takes a while before you actually see the sun uh, come up. And this is a very important thing. And they look to the tomb to, so they can find the corpse and finish off. The, when they buried Jesus, it was something done very hastily because that had finished before the Sabbath started. And Sabbath started at sundown. So they, they had a hurry. Um, but then we see similar responses. Remember I talked last time about the responses that came to Jesus' death. Now we see something else. Um, you know, there was uh, first a great earthquake. And that calls to mind the earthquake that happened when Jesus died in Matthew 27, verse 51. It said, Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and rocks were split. Now we see that there is an earthquake as they show up in Matthew 28, verse 2. Behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat upon it. And it says that the angel, uh, his appearance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Um, and this is in Matthew 28, verses 3 to 4. And uh, so that's uh, you know, something that even the guards witness that they uh, uh, see all of this happening. And it's a great irony to point out that now the soldiers became like dead men, while Jesus, the Son of Man, is no longer dead. So the soldiers who had put the Son of Man to death, now they, in the face of this earthquake, become like dead men. They're not dead, but they're, they're stunned into a silence and inaction that they don't know what to do. And they still don't see Jesus at this point. The, the, the stone was not rolled back to let Jesus out. It was rolled back to let the women in. And they are going to be witnesses to the empty tomb. And when they, we see in Mark 16, verse 5, on entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were amazed. Um, but then Luke also adds, but when they went in, they did not find the body. They were looking for the body. They expected to see the body. They didn't have an expectation of the resurrection. All this is very important. Uh, there have been some theologians who said, well, there really wasn't a resurrection, <coughs> but the apostles it, you know, felt Jesus' presence. They expected him to raise as he said he did, so they felt his presence in some spiritual way. No, they didn't. They didn't expect his presence at all. They expected a corpse. And that's why we see Luke 24, verses 4 to 5 mentioned. While they were perplexed about this, that's one of the first things. that They're as amazed as anybody. Behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, 
Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. So they have to be told. They, they still don't jump to the conclusion and say, oh, the tomb is empty. Jesus must have been raised from the dead, right? No, that's not at all. They're perplexed. They don't know what to make of this. And it requires these angels to explain to them what happened. Why? And, they, and they do it with this kind of um, rhetoric, you know, why are you looking for the dead guy? He's not here. Uh, it, it's, th this is a very important element. We see also in Matthew chapter 28, verse 5, but the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. Um, again, they're looking, they're looking for the crucified Jesus. It's all they expect. And this is a typical response from the angel. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. This is what uh, angels try to say all the time. Uh, in Mark, it's a little bit more strong than just fear. Do not be distressed. It's a, it's a stronger word and doesn't occur very often, in fact. And that they have to know the reason not to fear. Um, Jesus is risen. And we see it again in Mark 16, verse 6, that the angel said to them, Do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. And this is a very important uh, part of this, that here's the place. They, they Remember, the women had been at the crucifixion. They watched the burial. And they took note, it says in the, at the end of the uh, chapters on the crucifixion, said that they took note, they observed carefully where they had laid him. So they didn't want to go to the wrong tomb. And they weren't at the wrong tomb. Everybody else who was in a tomb stayed there. But Jesus is raised from the dead. And this is a, a very important uh, part of their witness. Now, we see in Luke 24, verses 5 to 7, they, as, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day, rise. So this was something the angel reminds them Jesus had prophesied. He had said this would happen. And <clears throat> this is a very important thing. Now, note, none of the four Gospels actually describe the moment of Jesus' resurrection. There's a, a, a gospel that is not used. It's, uh, it has some interesting ancient stuff in it. Uh, it's called the Gospel of Peter. And that book describes the resurrection and the moment of the resurrection and the angels taking Jesus out of the tomb. Um, but, you know, otherwise, the, the canonical gospel, the gospels that we accept as sacred scripture and inspired by the Holy Spirit, don't tell us about that moment. There's no witness to it except Jesus and the angels. And we don't hear anything about that. But this is something that they are told to try and understand. And the... Uh, there's, there's a great deal of irony that they're told not to be afraid because they're seeking Jesus, while the soldiers were afraid. Matthew 28, verse 4 mentions, For fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. 
Again, we mentioned them. They are filled with fear. They don't hear the angels say, fear not. They are caught in their fear. They're outside this relationship with Christ. The women are coming out of their great love for Jesus. They're showing tremendous devotion. I mean, going into a tomb where someone has been for a couple of days without any significant treatment, that would smell very bad. And going into a tomb would not be pleasant, but they're going to do this out of love for him and great devotion. The soldiers who have no love or devotion are filled with fear instead of their love. Something St. John mentions, perfect love cast out all fear. All they've got is fear. They don't have love. And then the angel goes on and gives them some instruction. Um, we, we see in Matthew 28, verse 7, the women are told, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has been risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. Lo, there you will see him. I have told you this. You see this in, also in Mark 16, verse 7. So both the Gospels talk about this. Um, and, you know, this is something that Christ had said at the Last Supper. Remember in Matthew 26, verse 32, after I'm raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. He had told them that this is what was going to happen. Now the angel is telling the women to instruct him in that. So this is, um, you know, a great deal of what went on. Now we're going to take a little break right now. But we'll come back and take a look at more aspects of this resurrection. So please stay with us. Continuing on with these, this, these first early morning appearances, and St. Luke mentions how the women remembered the words of his prediction in, math, in Luke chapter 24, verse 8, where he said they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. So this, you know, um, was something that the apostles themselves didn't believe. They still expected Jesus to be dead. They don't expect, you know, the women start putting this together because they were around. Jesus had said to the crowds as well as to the apostles that I'm going to Jerusalem to be handed over to the Gentiles and crucified, buried, and then on the third day I'll rise again. Now, and by the way, a lot of people get this confused too. He doesn't say after three days I will rise, the dead, or rise again from the dead. He says, on the third day. So he's, some people say, well, it had to be three full days. He wasn't, three. No, no, it says on the third day. So Friday he died, Saturday he remains in the tomb, Sunday's the third day on which he rises. And the Gospels all mention that it was on the first day of the week, which is, again, Sunday, uh, in our language, not there. In, in Hebrew and Arabic, you just call it uh, the first day of the week. That's the, the term for it. So this is what we see in those first three Gospels. Let's take a look a little bit at St. John. Um, 
St. John especially focuses on Mary Magdalene. And, you know, uh, it, it's very uh, important to take a look at that. Um, we should think about the Song of Songs and the great love. Again, I've, I've emphasized how much devotion and love these holy women are showing. And a good deal of what we see going on in St. John is meant to remind us of the Song of Songs, chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, where the woman says, Upon my bed by night I sought him whom my soul loves. I sought him but found him not. I called him, but he gave no answer. And then she says, I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the squares. I will seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him, but found him not. The watchmen found me, and as they went about in the city, have you seen him whom my soul loves? Scarcely had I passed them when I found him whom my soul loves. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me. So that, think about that passage and apply it to Mary Magdalene as she seeks Jesus out of a great love that she had for him. In contrast to the apostles who remain hiding in the upper room. So that's going to be a difference. Again, it's the difference between love and fear. And that is a key point in the way they behave. And then we see when she gets to the tomb, Mary saw that the stone rolled away. So let's take a look at John 20. Verses 1 to 2, And on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb while still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Now, on one hand, uh, she seems to be by herself. Uh, just John just focuses on her, but she mentions we don't know where they have laid him. Um, and she has this assumption that Jesus is still dead. She does not come to the conclusion that Jesus has uh, risen from the dead no conclusion that he is resurrected. And uh, she assumes that someone has stolen the body. You see that a few verses down in John 20, verse 13, where they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. I sometimes say that when I go to churches where I can't find where the tabernacle is. You know, they, 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 some churches hide the tabernacle. They've taken away my Lord. I know not where they laid him. It's a side point, though. Um, now, to go back to when she runs to Peter and the apostles, let's take a look at Peter's response how he and the beloved disciple came out with the other disciple and they went to the tomb. They both ran, but the other disciple outran Peter, probably because he's younger, and reached the tomb first and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying and the napkin which had, not, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must 
rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. So this is their first response. And it's interesting how, uh, again, we see this ongoing theme. The beloved disciple believed. He wasn't as filled with fear. He had more love. So he came to faith. And this goes together. That's why faith, hope, and love constantly have to go together. And while they returned, Mary Magdalene stayed at the tomb weeping. And we see in the next verses, by the way, there, there is a reference to Peter coming to the tomb in Luke 24, verse 12. Almost forgot that. In Luke 24, 12, it says, But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves. He went home wondering at what had happened. And also St. Paul mentions it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that Peter went there and saw the, and he saw the Lord. But anyway, back to Mary Magdalene. In John 20, verse 11 through 17, we see how Mary Magdalene stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Back to that. Saying this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus, just like Clopas and his son on the way to Emmaus. Take another uh, show. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. She still assumes that Jesus is dead. The body is some other place. And it's only when Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So in this, you know, she wants to cling on to him, just like the woman in the uh, Song of Songs, chapter 3. But he, she can't cling to him. She has to let him go so that he, he has more uh, of these, more people to see and more places to go. And he has to make this announcement. So this is uh, something very important. Notice it mentions that there are two angels. You see that following the uh, book of Deuteronomy, where you have two or three witnesses. They've got the angels and her. And this is a very important thing. But also note that she sees Jesus only when she stops looking at the tomb. And she turns toward Jesus, who she thinks is the governor. And just like the angels who took the initiative to speak, Jesus took the initiative to speak. And this is a, a very important thing that the, uh, the, this clinging to her, to, to Jesus, is not something that she should do, but he has his mission from the Father to complete, and he had not yet completed it. But Mary's love uh, does tell her to go to the apostles and to give that message. I'm ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. She, this time she doesn't tell them about the empty tomb, but about the risen Jesus. And this is a key element. We all can take a look at this in our own times and deal with our own lack of faith. And as we have that, uh, uh, sometimes a lack of love of Jesus, a lack of faith in him, 
lack of trust. We have, like a lot of people, we think that the tomb might not have been so empty and things like that. And theologians have thought that a lot too. But this is a call for us to look again at these passages and allow the Lord to stir up deeper faith within us in Him and in His glorious resurrection and to see how, to ask ourselves the question so we can see how this can change our lives. What impact does this resurrection have on us? Just as it had on Mary and the other women and the apostles. What change do we slowly and gradually have as we come to deepen our faith in the resurrection of Jesus? All right, let's uh, go to some of your questions. Let's start off with Roland, who is in Ontario, Canada. Roland, what can we do for you? Yes, we're from Timmins. It's a city in the bush where there's a lot of snow and ice. Yes, my question is, uh, Jesus was crucified and said he would rise on the third day. Where does that show in the ancient testament, in the Psalms, in one of the books, or well, which one? Sure. Great question. Great question. First of all, Micah chapter 6 mentions that he will rise on the third day. Okay, so take a look at Micah 6. And then also Psalm 16 speaks of how you will not let my body see corruption. Now, Psalm 16 is quoted by St. Peter on the day of Pentecost. And he says, it's written in the Psalms, Psalm 16, that you will not let my body see corruption. However, he says, David, this doesn't apply to David because David's tomb is still with us. In fact, it's right very close to the upper room was the tomb of David. So he said that doesn't apply to David because his tomb is with us. He did go undergo corruption. This verse that you will not let my body undergo corruption is uh, uh, something that applies to the Messiah, to Christ. So those are some of them. But also we see this hope for the general resurrection of the dead in the prophet Ezekiel chapter 37, uh, yeah, 37 uh, where the dry bones come together, and also in Isaiah 25. And this brings out something uh, that is very important the, in the Bible, throughout the Old Testament and into the New. Death is God's enemy. Death is God's enemy. And he came to defeat death. Now, it's going to be the last enemy he fully defeats. But by Christ rising from the dead, he is not only fulfilling these Old Testament prophecies, but he is also having this defeat of death that is, uh, I, I oftentimes compare it to the uh, invasion of Normandy. Once the Allies invaded Normandy and had a solid beachhead, they could drive the Nazis out of Europe. Similarly, now that Christ is raised from the dead, he can defeat Satan and defeat death itself. So that's, but that's where that comes from. Micah 6, uh, Ezekiel 37, uh, Isaiah 25, and of course, Psalm 16, most especially. Okay? We have a question from our studio audience. Sir, yes, hi, Father. where are you from? I'm from Charlotte, North Carolina. Good to have you here. Welcome. You. And your question? Uh, my question, you mentioned how the stone was not rolled away for Jesus, but was rolled away for the women who came. I, I never heard that before, and I was wondering, does that come from tradition? Is that in Scripture? No, no, think the logic. 
Was Jesus inside the tomb? When the, sto- the women saw the stone moved, so did Jesus come out at that moment? Oh, I didn't realize I had seen this stone. Yeah, moved. yeah. The, take a look at Matthew okay. 28. And so the, they go in and the tomb is already empty when the stone moves. So he didn't need it to get out. They needed to have the stone move so they could get in. So did they see the angels moving the stone? They, didn't, they don't say that the angels did. They just oh. say that it moved. Okay. Yeah, so take a look again at Matthew 28, verses 1 and 2. Great. Thank you very much. Sure. All right. Now, I have to take a little break. We'll come back in a minute with a couple of minutes with your questions and those from our studio audience. So please stay with us. Welcome back. Uh, First of all, I'd like to invite you to join me on Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for EWTN Live. I plan to be speaking with the pastor of St. John Chrysostom, Melkite Catholic Church in Atlanta, Georgia. We Father Elias Dorham, and we will discuss the joy of forgiveness within marriage and how spouses can view the ordinary challenges of marriage as encounters with Jesus Christ, which is part of keeping a Christ-centered marriage. Okay, So we'll be talking about that. It'll be a good, good discussion. Let's now go over to Tony in the great state of New York. Tony, what can we do for you? Yes, Father Mitch. Yes. Yes, Father Mitch. Uh, I'm I'm calling in I'm calling in regard to stopping or interrupting the sacrifice of a mass for any reason. Mm -hmm. I was always told, in in particular, especially during the Eucharistic prayer, Mm -hmm. a mass is not it is not to be stopped or interrupted for any reason. Mm -hmm. I attend a mass where there's elder elderly attending. And suddenly someone becomes ill, whether it be a heart attack or some other mm-hmm. uh, physical episode. Is there uh what are the rules? I try to research this myself with the canon rules and laws and and I, I just don't know. I don't know yeah. what the rules are. Yeah, there's there's generally not a rule. Uh for certain if the priest has a heart attack, the, you interrupt the mass. But you don't completely end it. If the, if the priest has a heart attack or something, uh, or like that poor bishop in Australia who was attacked and stabbed multiple times by an assailant, um, you know, in Australia, I don't know if you saw that in Sydney, it was horrible, horrible. But if that happens and the priest can't go on or dies, then another priest must come, pick up the Mass where the other one left off, and bring it to completion. The Mass has to be completed. Now, in the case of somebody dying, well, first of all, the, the, the modern world is pretty cool. Uh, you can call, you, everybody's got cell phones, and they can call the emergency. Uh, once that happened to me, where... The, you know, I uh, quickly administered the last rites. We, you know, so I, I re- interrupted at the uh, readings, gave the last rites, and then let the doctors and the ambulance take care of it. But if you uh, have uh, that kind of emergency, um, because everybody would be somewhat panicked, you might uh, want to have a pause, but you don't stop the mask completely. Uh, take care of the immediate situation, and then 
complete the Mass. The Mass needs to be completed. It's the action of Christ, and it needs to be brought to full completion. Um, but you want to make sure that you, you take care. Now, I've, I have done a liturgy where, uh, you know, someone had a heart attack, and, uh, you know, I, I didn't even know, so I just kept going. Um, in fact, it was a wedding, uh, and the father of the groom had a heart attack. He, but I thought he fainted, um, so, and I just kept going. And a year later, I saw him for the baptism of his first grandchild, and I told him, you going to give me any more trouble? <laughs> Which he didn't. Uh, he was a good sport about it, too. But um, you, 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 you know, you don't lightly interrupt mass, but if there's an emergency or if there's a fire, uh, then you have to let everybody out. Uh, and then complete, if, the, if the Eucharist has been consecrated already, the priest needs to, if he can possibly, take the Eucharist with him and then still complete the mass in another place. You know, if say there was an emergency or if there's an attack, you know, again, like that poor bishop, uh, you know, and other times in history, mass has been attacked. Um, we've seen that a lot in places like Iraq uh, and elsewhere. So um, these are the kind of things that we don't want to have happen. But, um, you know, we try to get as little interruption as possible and complete the integrity of the Holy Eucharist. Okay, so those, uh, but you know, these are emergency situations, and you know there are no clear and definite rules for a lot of them. But you know, one of the things you have to keep a cool head, use your good sense, um, and uh, then continue on with the mass. Okay, if it happens before the sermon, the priest might have to shorten it. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from uh, New York, Up Lady, the Blessed Sacrament Parish. Great, in good to have you here. Good Thank to have you here. Thank you for taking my question. From, from Queens, right? Yes. Oh, good. I am. So what, what can we do for you? Well, as you were speaking about Mary Magdalene at the tomb, uh, another example, the apostles uh, on the way to Emmaus, and when the other apostles first start to see Jesus again after his resurrection, they all seem not to recognize him as he was. Mm -hmm. So something obviously changed with his physical appearance, and then what do we take from that on our change sure. after the resurrection? Sure. A couple things. First of all, it's very important. I talked a little bit about this last week, uh, and it's something to remind ourselves often. Christ was not resuscitated from the dead. Lazarus was, the widow of Nain's son was resuscitated, the daughter of Jairus was resuscitated, but Jesus was resurrected in a glorified body that won't die again. The others all died again. I mentioned last week, I believe. I went to Lazarus' first tomb in Bethany many, many times. One time I was stuck a, a bit in the city of Larnaca and discovered that's where Lazarus' second tomb is. Oh, it was cool. You know, when a plane doesn't show up and things like that, sometimes the Lord's doing something else. So, you know, uh, so I got to go see Lazarus' second tomb. Not many people get to do that. That's pretty cool. Uh, Jesus won't have another tomb. He's not resuscitated. And in that glorification of his body, it's, he's there, it's he. That's why they touch it, the wounds in his hands and his feet. And yet he looks different and it's hard to recognize. You know, if you've known somebody who was very seriously ill at some point, and they're pale and skinny and all this, and then you see them a few years later and they're in completely wonderful health. It's like, is that you? You know, ever have that experience? It, well, that's a dim reflection of the change in Jesus. 
So it's not just that he has color in his skin again after being dead, but he is glorious. And that's why it's hard to recognize him. Now, I'm afraid some of the brothers and sisters from the Kingdom Hall of the Jehovah's Witnesses have another goofy theory. Um, they believe <laughs> that Jesus was, his spirit was going around and taking bodies from different tombs. If somebody died fresh, he would take their body. Now, that's just as goofy as I'll get out in my mind. Um, bless their hearts, but that just ain't right. And so um, that's not what we believe. Jesus' body was raised, the tomb was empty, and it's his one body. That's all that's raised up. All right, we have Pat in the Republic of Texas in Dallas. Pat, what can we do for you? Hi, hi Father Mitch. I love your show. Thanks. Um, I wanted to ask, regarding the resurrection, what happened to the Roman soldiers in regards to, I assume they had to report back to their superiors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what did they report? Well, see, this is, <laughs> first they went to the, uh, the chief priests. Do you remember that? Take a look at Matthew 28. We're going to talk about that in the coming weeks. But they went and reported this to the priest, and they said, here's a significant little gift for you. Um, don't you know, tell everybody that somebody came and stole his body. And uh, don't worry about the governor. We'll make it right with him. So that's what they did. Now, what's interesting is when you read Acts of the Apostles, you see that the apostles are put on trial a number of times, right? And so is St. Stephen the deacon. But at every single trial, the priests are questioning them, but nobody says, all right, where did you guys hide the body? Nobody does that. Uh, the, let's go to the tomb. We'll show you the body is still in there. Nobody says that either. And so, the, uh, and what, it's interesting that the priests seem to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. They know that he's out of the tomb. And they don't accuse the apostles of stealing the body or the body still being there. They just tell them, shut up and stop blaming us. Sounds like Congress. But at any rate, the, um, but this is... <laughs> So, uh, just joking, joking, uh, and I'll be arrested. So at any rate, so at any rate, you know, they, that's all they got. So this, that didn't work either. Okay, but thank, that's a great question, Pat. All right. Thank you. We've run out of time. May the Lord bless you and help us all to come to a more lively faith in Jesus who's raised and glorified for us. And may Almighty God bless you the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, this network is brought to you by you. That's how our Lord inspired Mother Angelica to have it work instead of advertising and such. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And then we'll be able to pay our bills too. God bless you and thank you.